Good afternoon. My name is Jackie Hoyt, and I am the president of the board of the Johann Fuss Library Foundation. And it is my honor to welcome you to our beautiful library loggia for our inaugural Literature of the Courtyard. Today's event is the first of 15 years of Literature in the Courtyard events that have been generously endowed by Cotton Hanley. Cotton has been a special friend of the Johann Fuss Library Foundation for nearly 30 years, including serving as a board member from 1996 to 2008, and for four of those years as president. She has truly been integral to the progress the foundation has enjoyed over these years, and we extend our most sincere thanks to you, Cotton, for this meaningful gift to the Library Foundation, but also to our entire community. So Cotton, will you please stand so we may present you with this small token of our appreciation. <laughs> what, you don't wanna hold those all for the next hour? We are thrilled that all of you could be here today along with so many that are also participating live stream to hear a lively conversation between Tom McGuane, one of the most revered authors of our time, and our very own dedicated board member, John Cleghorn. Tom is an island resident and a national literary treasure whose extraordinary body of work includes 10 novels, four short story collections, and three nonfiction works. Tom also wrote and directed four screenplays, Rancho Deluxe, The Missouri Breaks, Tom Horn, and 92 in the Shade. In 2018, he released Cloudbursts, 38 pieces of collected and new stories, which was selected as a Wall Street Journal 10 Best Books of the Year. <laughs> Tom's many honors include a Wallace Stegner Fellowship, election to the prestigious Academy of Arts and Letters, and a national book nomination. In addition to his many literary accolades, he was also elected to the National Cutting Horse Association Hall of Fame and the Fly Fishing Hall of Fame. While planning for our today's event, our board concluded there is no one better suited than John Cleghorn to facilitate today's conversation with Tom McGuane. John retired as chairman and chief executive officer of Royal Bank of Canada in 2001. In addition to his long and impressive career in finance and banking, he holds positions of distinction in various organizations, including serving as current director of the Atlantic Salmon Federation, chancellor emeritus of Wilfrid Laurier University, and governor emeritus of McGill University. John and his wife, Patty, spend their time between Toronto, Port Carling, Ontario, and Boca Grande. John is a current director and past president of the Johann Fuss Library Foundation from 2019 to 2021. Like Tom, John is a passionate outdoor enthusiast and spends his free time fly fishing, skiing, and golfing. The good news is John is also an avid reader and that is so good because over the past several months, John has been carefully reading most of Tom's voluminous writings in preparation for today's discussion. What a wonderful opportunity it is for all of us to enjoy this special conversation today. I have two quick housekeeping items. Please silence your cell phone if you haven't done so already. And just so you are aware, Tom has graciously offered to sign books and make books available for sale after the program. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to present to you Tom McGuane and John Cleghorn. We're gonna do a little test. Is that about right? Okay, can you hear in the back? You can hear? Okay, louder. Oh, the four, poor folks in the front. <laughs> Press the button. We're just 
Don't press the button, right? Doesn't matter. No. Okay, is that it? Okay. Now, over 70 years ago, Tom first came to Boca Grande with his dad to go fishing. What was it like then? Exactly as it is today. <laughs> Bring your mic up. Exactly as it is today. Nothing's changed. Uh, we lived <clears throat> in the 50s. We lived over Bay near Venice. And uh, it was quite primitive. I mean, it was a town that still had an occasional Ku Klux Klan par parade. Still had a, a Ku, Ku Klux Klan parade. Is that better? Is that good? And um, we, uh, we built a little house over there. We dug a foundation for it and uh, scattered rattlesnakes uh, as we did. And when it seemed safe, my mother took her little dog, Freddie, down to look at the foundation. And uh, an alligator came out of the brush on its hind legs, determined to get Freddie. My mother lived to a ripe old age, but she never recovered from that moment back in the early <laughs> She had never heard of PTSD, but that was the... <laughs> back in that day, for, for a family of fishermen, Boca Grande was where you wanted to go. This was before there was a bridge. And my father and my brother and I would come down here on fish. And I caught my first tarpon here in 1951. Seems unbelievable to me to say that because I'm still tarpon fishing. Um, but we also fished with a, 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 a sort of a skiff guide. That's not what they called him in the day, named Robbie, who was a redhead. And he'd, we fished with him a lot. And he had uh, he'd gotten skin cancer from being in the sun so long, and it finally killed him. So my dad and a couple of his pals and my brother and I were ordered to get dressed up, wear coats and ties, and come down to what was then called Whitewash Alley, now Tarpon Street, um, and uh, attend the, the funeral. So we went into this little old house, and then Robbie was laid out in the front room, and the widow was dressed in black in the back of the room. And when we entered with our ties and our coats and everything, she looked up and said, there's the sons of bitches that killed my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was back in the day. Boca Grande is such a great place now. And by the way, it's so nice to have people turn out like this as you have for other speakers. I don't know anywhere else where this goes on in uh, short notice. It's a cultivated group of people on a pretty cultivated island. I'm so glad to see you. Um, so that's about all I have to say about it at that time. I always wanted to live here. Uh, and uh, 30 or 40 years, 35 years ago, my wife and I bought a house here. We've had a few of them. Um, and it's still the same magical place. But back in the day when they were drying nets on the beach um, and the old sort of Conky community was still intact, and people who went back to uh, Civil War days were living on the island. It was the atmosphere was a little different, but still great. Thank you, Tom. I started laughing when he was going to describe the story about his mom and the. Uh, my wife doesn't even like the word snake, let alone the letter S. So, <laughs> sorry, Patty. Um, Tom, this was I, I think the first book that I, I read of yours some time ago, The Longest Silence. A Life in Fishing. He's done three uh, books that are nonfiction. And somebody who writes about fishing, you know, often they can't help but talk about how terrific they were. <laughs> Tom gives you both sides of it, you know, the, the hours spent of, of learning. I mean, he doesn't do anything by half. There's only one thing in all of his accounts of his various episodes <laughs> was when he bought a motorcycle. And I won't get into that now. We may get into that. But he has done everything to the letter and, and then some, except that in that case, the letter was the manual how to operate it. And he didn't know how to start it. And he had to push it home after he bought it. So, <laughs> But I would just like, I'm not going to get into a lot of fishing stories. This is just a little paragraph that he writes. And I might add that a family has been in Wisconsin for about a hundred years. This is our hundredth anniversary, and it's a fishing lodge, family camp. About two hundred members now go there, 
And uh, the, the people that, uh, that go there live in Boca Grande as well. And they wanted something to kind of lead off the, the history of the last hundred years. And they picked a paragraph from Tom's book on fishing, and I just want to recount it to you. The motto of every serious angler. Now, I expect most people that fish know what angler is, but perhaps not everybody in the room who want to hear Tom, the author, talk don't know what angler is. But an angler is a fisher person, but actually a fisherman. That's what they are. And the serious angler is, quotes, nearer my God to thee. And the other saying, of course, is that God does not count the days you go fishing. <laughs> right, that's why we do it, you see. So humans have suspected for thousands of years that angling and religion are connected. But if you can find no higher, uh, uh, higher ideal than outfishing your buddies, Catching something big enough to stuff or winning a, and put it on a wall or winning a trophy, you've got a lot of work to do before you are what Isaac Walton, who wrote The Complete Angler, and by the way, he lived from 1593 to 1683. And it was hard to live for 90 years in those days unless you were a fisherman. Now that's, that's what uh, Isaac Walton would call an angler. You're doing it for the spirit of a thing. Wonderful. I'd rather outfish my friends, actually. <laughs> hey, Tom. Tom? <laughs> Tom, he wants you to put the... Uh, Check. Our boss over here. Oh, yeah. Put it right to my... my yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, just the way the people in the back can hear you and the people at home can hear you, sir. I just, I just feel like I'm under arrest or something. <laughs> <laughs> He's the old pro here telling you. <laughs> Same like thing? Yeah. It's very awkward, Tom. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. We're always learning. Uh, we're, we're always learning. Now, you started off with that story about the tarpon, your first tarpon. And you've done a lot of tarpon fishing. And even when you describe them in your non-fishing books about yourself, it isn't all about cat. You've had great success. A year ago in March, off uh, 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 Burnt Stores, he tied into a, and this is by measurement only, not gaffing it and hanging it at the dock later. It, it was released live, 184 pounds, on a fly. I just landed. Said, John, I can't tell you how I appreciate this because you just added 24 pounds to the fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's generosity. Well, I, 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 I guess I didn't hear you right. <laughs> but he's also just had his uh, shoulder replaced <laughs> because he used to be a roper before he was a, a, a cutting horse uh, rider and a long life of fishing. Now, different careers. He's, he's certainly, uh, you know, fisherman, author, uh, horseman, rancher, um, very occasional uh, motorcycle rider, but a sailor, and so on, and uh, loves nature. And just to just to get into both his his fiction and nonfiction is a joy, and it's been a great pleasure uh, for me and a privilege really to get to know the man before I met the man, just through his writing, and his fiction is quite different. Now. Your first book that you did was called uh, The Sporting Club, and that was in, in your late 20s. Yep. And that took place mainly in Michigan. That's right. Not, not down in the Keys like many of the others did. Can you talk a little, because you're from Michigan. Right. Well, I am from Michigan, but my family are all from uh, Massachusetts, and it was a place that my, my uh, how am I doing? <laughs> 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 my, I see my wife signaling. She has another signal of when these things go on too long. She catches my eye and goes, <laughs> and we, we, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> but I'm worried. I'm averting my eyes. <laughs> uh, I, I grew up in Michigan, but all my cousins and my grandparents and my, my aunts and my uncles all lived in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. So I have a fairly light hold uh, on 
the state of Michigan, and I haven't been there in a very long time. I moved. I had a girlfriend from Wyoming whose father uh, gave me summer jobs, and I really never left uh, the northern Rockies since that time. Um, but uh, I, I still miss Michigan in some ways. It was a great place to grow up, and we had I loved, loved to trout fish, and it was great then. Uh, in fact, maybe it was better than it is in Montana now. Um, so uh, that's it. I don't have a... I, it was an interesting place where I lived. It was a town that had been settled by the French, and a lot of my classmates' families had been in the community for 400 years, for, which is almost unheard of in the Middle West. Um, they're all French uh, descended. One of, one of them, one um, uh, friend of mine who's forebear had, had, uh, had worked at the Cadillac encampment in Detroit in the 1700s, um, became a Cadillac dealer. Isn't, how's that for his, his historic symmetry? So, but I have very little to say about Michigan. I've been gone so long, I don't have many impressions to convey to you. Well, when you were a youngster, you used to travel, I think, back to your uh, mother's grandparents in, in uh, New England. Mm -hmm. Now, if you haven't, and Jackie mentioned the book Cloudburst. This is a wonderful book of his short stories, uh, all nonfiction. But this has a ring to it that it may be just uh, maybe a little bit of, of some earlier memories that you then wove into a story. And I just would ask you just to read a small section of it. It's called Miracle Boy. Okay, let me see. What section is it? John's the only one who remembers this stuff. <laughs> he, just, he just read it. Um, okay. This is, Can you see and hold I can't see. I've just borrowed Here. Uh, you sure? some glasses. Yeah. So starting, where do you want to start? There. Just start there and then read where I... Oh, that's a lot of reading, John. <laughs> Uh, okay, and where does it go on to this page, too? Do you want me to help you? Yeah, why don't you do that? Uh, you, want you want to, to hold, hold this? I'll that hold would be great. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? Um, we always went back to my mother's, grand, my mother's hometown when someone was about to die. We missed Uncle Kevin because the dust, doctors misdiagnosed his ruptured appendix owing to referred pain to his shoulder. Septicemia killed him before they set it, sorted it out with a victorious air that we never forgave. The liverless baby was well before our time. It would have been older than my mother had it lived, but my grandfather's departure arrived ideally for scheduling purposes in the late stages of diabetes. We drove instead of taking the train and en route, en route were able to see Steve, I'm sorry I'm stumbling because I haven't seen this in 30 years. <laughs> um, we're able to stay over for an extra day at the Algonquin Inn in western New York, taking advantage of Wiener Schnitzel night and still make it in time for the various obsequies while reducing prolonged visits by priests. My father was an agnostic and fought sponging clergy with vigor, remarking that he had, quote, fronted his last snockered prelate <laughs> and adding, it's amazing how it's often crown royal. <laughs> Before I relate the death of my grandmother, I have to summarize that of my grandfather, that of my grandfather, because he was where I acquired my short-lived reputation as a worker of household wonders. Ever since, I have had great sympathy for those identified as seers or healers. My heart even goes out to those merely called lucky. Like someone drifting lazily down the Niagara River, the big fall is just a matter of time. My grandfather, though a diabetic, went on occasional sweet binges, cherry pies at Al Mac's diner, and he injected himself with insulin daily to our agog fascination. He held in reserve giant sugar-filled jawbreakers in his pocket, and when I was too pressing Pressingly talkative, a single one of those hunks would keep me quiet for over three hours. <laughs> he was a quiet man, a volunteer fireman, played checkers in the open-fronted firehouse down whose brass pole I was sometimes allowed to slide. In, am I just skip this little part here? In his youth? Oh, just, just what you've circled, right? On the 4th of July, 
While most of the family was at the parade on North Main Street, and after a midday meal of quahog chowder, swordfish, beet greens, and corn, he laid down on his big brown favorite couch and died. When I got home from the parade, my grandmother, my grandfather was dead. I studied the adults for clues. They were studying my grandmother for clues. She took to her bed. Three days later, she was still there. Her absence brought the household to a standstill. My mother and aunt seemed entirely helpless without her ordering them around. She did not even seem to acknowledge them when they visited her room. And a meeting was called where it was decided to send me in. Her idealization of children was counted upon to bring her around before the house and its contents sank into the earth, an eventuality I could imagine to include the opaque projector in the kitchen in the attic with its pictures of long dead baseball players, the cabinet full of Balik china in the priest parlor, all the wildly squeaky beds and creaking stairs, the bookless library reeking of cigars, and even the souvenir Hitler youth knife my, my Uncle Paul had given me. As it happened, I was the only child available for idealizing, standing around with my mouth hanging open, and so I headed to my grandmother's bedroom, which was on the second floor, and there I acquired my reputation as a performer of miracles, setting myself up for a fall whose effects would never end. When my father learned of my success, he began calling me Miracle Boy, later MB. I myself, I let myself in without knocking, closing the door behind me. From her bed, my grandmother followed me with her eyes. I started to say something in greeting, but the impulse died. And instead, I looked around for a place to sit. The ornate brass bed was to the right as I entered. To the left was a vanity with a silver brush and a mirror carefully arranged. At the far end of the room was a door to a small porch over Brownell Street, access to which we were all denied as it sagged dangerously with dry rot. I took the chair from in front of the dresser pulled it up beside my grandmother's bed, and I sat down. I was perfectly comfortable. My grandmother had turned her head on the pillow to look directly at me, upon, at me, upon me, and I could tell that my presence was welcome. After a while, several formulaic remarks on the death of my grandfather passed through my mind, since even then I was capable of a modicum of glibness in the little old man style encouraged by my aunts. But those thoughts vanished, and I gazed at my grandmother's long hair gathered around her face in silver braids. My mind wandered again, and then I spoke. I was wondering, I mused, if Grandpa left me any jewels. <laughs> my, my grandmother stared at me, sitting on my hands in her vanity chair, knocking the toes of my shoes against each other as the silence lengthened. Suddenly, she began to laugh from some deep place and loud enough that the scurrying of my mother and my aunts could be heard just outside the door, where they must have been eavesdropping. Then my grandmother sent me away so she could rise, dress, and make supper. Thus was born my reputation as a child healer, my personal albatross, Miracle Boy. <laughs> That's only the beginning of a wonderful story. Thank you, Tom. I, I have to tell you the end of this story from real life, which I don't think I really included here, which is my Uncle Frank, who was a sort of uh, damaged veteran, OSS veteran from World War II, was a drunk, and, uh, and a really a selfish drunk. And he was the baby of the family. And uh, my brother and I were uh, commissioned to go see him and say, you know, uh, but this was when my grandmother was dying. He, he was com commissioned to go see, see him and say, Ma wants to see you. You're the, her baby. She hasn't seen you in a long time. He was living nearby. And um, can you break your, your pattern here a little bit and come with us to see your mother? She's about to die. And he said, looked at my brother and I, and he said, what you two don't understand 
is that sick people depress me. <laughs> <laughs> Now, for a number of years, you were both at the ranch and uh, also down in, in Key West and wrote several books down there. Um, some of those are quite something to read during COVID and other things, you know, in terms of not bringing yourself really up until you have to go back and maybe read one of your non nonfiction short essays, which are a little more uh, positive. But then you get into it again. You want to want to be uh, some of those fast, fascinating, weird people that you could imagine <laughs> that apparently weren't, it wasn't all of, out of your imagination. Some of that was actually just papered over the real, the real deal. Key Weston that day was, uh, uh, I remember going down there. I'd read about it a lot, thinking it was a really literary town that was affordable, and it was a very run-down place. 50 years ago, I can't remember now. But Duval Street, you've all been on Duval Street. It was all boarded up. There was only one horrible place um, that you could bring your parents to get something to eat. It was called the A&B Lobster House. And um, a friend of mine, who's a snarky poet, said the only thing memorable about the A&B Lobster House was the enormous triceps of the Navy wives who worked there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Key West was a, such an exciting place, you know, nobody wore any shoes. Uh, it was a very high, and kind of highly integrated place. There was a, a large black community uh, who were really island blacks. They weren't uh, continental blacks. They spoke like islanders. Um, they fished, commercially fished, and the turtle crawls were uh, commercial turtle fishing and wound up all intact and the old houses were uh, beautiful as they still are but uh, they were nobody really wanted them I mean they were you could live there so inexpensively it was an ideal place for hippies we were sort of hippies um, and aspiring artists one kind or another and there was always somebody to talk to a lot of really interesting people so uh, it was not a great place to raise children I mean it was a you know, it was a pretty undone in terms of public services. And so I had been going back and forth between Montana and Key West. And when my, uh, my young son was uh, time to go to serious school, I thought I'd better get back out to Montana. And I'm glad I did because it's a great place to raise children. We have fantastic public schools in Montana. The University of Montana has the highest uh, uh, quota of Rhodes Scholars per capita of any university in the world. Um, and it's, you know, it's the last bastion of two-parent households, and there's no money in the educational system. Uh, and our kids have really been beneficiaries of it. My, my granddaughter uh, went from public school in a cow town to Harvard, graduated magna cum laude, and never missed a step. Uh, her brother's uh, at Penn. He's going to graduate summa cum laude if he stays on track. But these are all launched by the public school systems in Montana. I hope they don't go downhill, but they, uh, they were a good place to have your kids. What was the question? <laughs> I don't know, but that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as, as you go through the, the, the different books that, that he's written, um, and i uh, thinking of Jackie's uh, introduction, uh, let's just say that my banking background, people that were associated with banking in all of his books, let's just say they're not on, the, on his podium of popularity. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was the, the, the people that do different kinds of fishing. Now, he's done all kinds of fishing. And the one he loves, I think, the most is, is trout fishing because it's right there. I asked you the other day, uh, how many days do you fish? And you said, well, I fish every day in Montana. It's right there. Right yeah, on my right. front from lawn. So he has he has references to the kinds of people that do the type of fishing that's available. And two interested me. One was steelhead fishing, which another reason why his uh, shoulder had to be replaced. 
Steelhead fishing is re used to be referred to as the fish of a thousand casts. And the similar one, now a lot of steelhead are out west, and some on the Great Lakes as well, but out, out west, British Columbia, Oregon, and so on. And the other is Atlantic salmon, which I'm involved with. Now, I actually, I do both steelhead fishing in the Great Lakes, and I have done it out in British Columbia, but I also have, I do re Atlantic salmon regularly. And this is what, what he typifies as steelhead fisherman and Atlantic salmon fisherman. He's got a little bit of background. You see, trout fishing is very intimate, and you use little flies that you have to tie yourself. I don't know if you've got the eye power to still do that now, because some of those little, little flies, anyway, it's intricate. It's, you've got to really be good in terms of casting. And he refers to this robotic, many cast for steelhead and so on. And Atlantic salmon are like the fish of 10,000 casts as well. And I'm just going to size up how he describes. You have to have a heavy arm and a room temperature IQ to do that. <laughs> and a stipend. St oh, you did say that. You did say, of course, you have to have waiters in a, and a stipend, yes. You know, I, I, one thing I love about, I love Atlantic salmon fishing too. But it's a sort of a, it's a not cheap. Um, and uh, steelhead fishing is a much more of a cross-section of the, of the cultures. And one of the last times I was steelhead fishing in British Columbia, you see these local Canadian guys who are really great fishermen, uh, and they have um, no other ac foreseeable activity. And they have these get-her-done hats and fanny packs. And I was fishing a run, and a couple of them came up and said, uh, uh, you from the States? And I said, yeah. And uh, they said, you know, we're trying to close the border at Montana and save the fish. And I said, well, I said, we're going to keep coming. And he said, well, let me ask you something. You want to smoke some dope? And I said, <laughs> and I, said I, don't, I don't think so. And he said, how, do you realize how slow this sport is? You can't do this without smoking dope. <laughs> so. Well, much of his life is also oh, the shoulder uh, repair. Uh, his early days as a roper, of course, uh, contributed to that. But um, Tom, if if you will, I've selected a couple. Just the story. This is this is nonfiction book on some horses. His description of horses, his description of animals, uh, his love of them, love of nature, and so on. And it's just to understand a little bit about, and I say just a little bit about cutting horses. So just, just read the parts that I've cut. Uh, you know, it's a, it's uh, a link there. Oh, yeah. This is Buster. Uh, one, of the, one of the nice encounters uh, on this episode that we're in was, is, uh, is meeting John. And, you know, I've lived this sort of bizarre life. And meeting somebody who's done so well in the real world. And then he read all my books. And he was so diligent, I can't remember them. And I thought, this is how John got ahead. I mean, so I should... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little long in the tooth to be l learning these l life traits, but anyway. <laughs> that doesn't seem exotic to a lot of people, but to a lifelong artist, you think, well, isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> anyway. Um, yes, this is, a, this is a little passage about um, a hero of mine, uh, Buster Welch, who's the toughest guy I've ever known. Tom, Tom knows him. He's 93 years old. He's had a couple of uh, strokes. Uh, and just to give you a tiny anecdote before I read this, to give you an idea how tough he is, he had a big ranch. He ran a 50,000-acre ranch, mostly leased. He had one uh, incredibly talented but illegal Mexican working for him. And by saying incredibly talented, I'll tell you that uh, uh, Jose, one time we we blew up the truck and, and Buster's engine and Buster's truck and uh, Jose hunted, hoisted the engine out of it uh, in, in a mesquite tree and in a day and a half it was back in the truck and running perfectly. And that's the kind of talented guy he was. He was and Buster's a kind of a, in some ways, a kind of a bigoted uh, West Texas local guy. And he's always saying things like, you know, these Mexicans are like coyotes, they're all over the place. 
And then you'll ask him, excuse me, his name is Vicente. You ask him about Vicente. Vicente is the finest man I've ever known. You know, he doesn't get the contradiction. <laughs> but as a glimpse of Buster's toughness, uh, he would come, moved into town when he was about 90. He would drive out to the ranch during the day. And uh, he drives like a bat out of hell. He just chuckles. He says, nobody will ever ride with me. Uh, and he's got a battered old Cadillac. And, um, but he, he left his little house. He was in a little wheeler, wheelchair, a little electric filed wheelchair. He went out the front door of his house at his place in Abilene. He went around to the back door of his house. It was March. The nights were getting into the 30s. And he tried to climb his little uh, wagon over the back door. And he high-centered it over the back step. And he just endured. His son found him came out to the went out to the ranch, saw he wasn't there, so he came into Abilene to look for him, and Buster looked at it and said, I've been here for four days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, but that didn't seem like a big deal to him. He was just, he was a grandson of, a great grandson of people who rode with Fitzhugh Lee and the Confederacy, Texas Cavalry. Uh, he was just a one of a kind, an absolute one of a kind. But anyway, obviously, as you can see, I worship him. And uh, I'll just read whatever this is that John has given me. <laughs> yeah. Of the hands working on Buster's ranch, hailing from Texas, Washington, and Australia, there was an array of talent in general cow work. But no, f so far as I could discern, nobody didn't want to be a cutting horse trainer. There's considerable competition and activity for people interested in cutting horses in Australia. But the country is so vast, especially the cattle country, that well-educated hands go home and basically dry up for lack of seeing one another or for being unable to cope with the mileage necessary to get to cuttings. Nevertheless, such as the situation is, much of the talent in Australia grew up under Buster's tutelage. Buster is very fond of his Australians and think they are like the old-time West Texans who took forever to fill the trash hole behind his house. Buster has said to me several times that he would like to have lived in Australia. The, the trash hole, let me take, advert, hand him advert here. He filled his, the trash hole like we do outside of his house every year. And he said the pioneers that lived there had lived there for 80 years and they never quite filled it. Um, cowboys, hmm? They didn't waste any. Cowboys have their well-known high spirits but under Buster's guidance, they are all quiet and polite. At meals, they rise, introduce themselves, shake hands, and try to be helpful. In their limited spare time, these cowboys make the Saturday night run to town, or they attend, attend Bible classes, or they hole up in the bunkhouse to listen to heavy metal on their boom boxes. Buster finds something to like in each of them. One is industrious, another is handy with machinery, another has light hands with a colt, and so on. Every time he works his horse, they watch him studiously, reminding me of the advantages of, advantages of apprenticeship. There was a sharp contrast between these vigilant young men, these vigilant young men, and the barely awake denizens of a college lecture hall. Now the book of some horses, the book, the, the one about Roni that you wrote, uh, that was a cutting horse that he had to get close to. So close that he brought his writing desk right into the stall with Roni. And then every once in a while, like he's normal, a normal human being, he has to get up maybe, you know, uh, take, a, take a little walk, and the horse wouldn't let you. So you, yeah. The stories of you being close to your horses. Now, you've spent a lot of time. Uh, well, both of you have, yes. Laurie stories does. of both of you as champion. Lori does all the work. I've told people what it's like to have my job sitting there fluttering the keys when Lori goes by the window on the tractor. This is a division of labor. <laughs> Condemned by conscientious people worldwide. Cutting horse champion. She was. Yeah. Yeah. Easily Some great out. stories of the two of you. Yeah. Well, 
Bobby, who really is in charge of this whole thing today, Bobby Marquis, um, who volunteered Tom and volunteered me, um, she, she has this actually on a, on a time frame here. Because we would like to get some questions you know, from the audience. And there's one last story about a horse. And it's this true, true story. And the story is called A Foal. And I thought maybe you could read just uh, a section or two, but it is so beautifully written. I, I can't read it. I cry. <laughs> a full. The whole thing. Okay. Yeah, forget, forget my, just, just. Okay. So we got to get you some clean. First letter to the last. Okay. Oh, boy. Okay. Yeah, no, it's All fabulous. Right. Boy, I haven't seen this in a long time. Maybe I'll. Don't cry. I'll snivel. I try only to snivel and call it a day. It isn't really summer until the shelter belt on the east side of the corrals leaves out. That makes all the difference because it blocks the sun in the first corral. It is also the time when if you sit in the ancient Crow Vision Quest site on the western side of the ranch, you will see the sun rise at the center of the valley in a remarkable suggestion of the first light of the world. I had three mares confined. Two had, already their two had already had their colts, and the third, my adored quarter horse, horse, Lulu, was three weeks late and very uncomfortable. The saddle horses, five geldings, including two venerated pensioners in their <laughs> 20s, stayed close to the corrals in their pasture because they were interested in these births and had proven to be doting uncles over the years. But in the summertime at first light, they were usually lying down asleep in the sun. Nothing moved, not even their tails, because it was still too cool for flies. <laughs> I usually get up early and head to the bunkhouse where I work. I don't always go straight in there, as I try to suggest by my brisk departure. I worried that in that building, hunched over a legal pad, still in the trance of sleep, I might feel irony was required, and it was much too early for that. Though in the early quiet, it is often to big issues one's mind, one's mind wanders, guilt at all this tranquility, feeling that I, in my work, had been diminished by 30 years of rusticating among the Missouri small, Missouri's smallest headwaters. At such times, I console myself with some literary anecdote, like Mencken's remark that he didn't care how well Willa Cather wrote. He was not interested in anything that happened in Nebraska. A remark that blew up in Mencken's face like an exploding cigar. Or I think of the ways Montaigne got everyone to visit him in the boondocks and so on and so forth. I was carrying my coffee. A small river whispers around the edge of the yard and down behind the barn, a sparkling freestone river that springs from a mountain range I can see to the south. Its height changes daily according to melt-offs and storms in the mountains, events I couldn't detect. But I can see the dark rings around the stones when the river is falling, and the shells of transforming stoneflies, the dart of yellow warblers crossing the river to their willow nests. Lulu had not been happy, not eating, strangely unimpressed by the snacks I kept in my coat. And after two weeks, her broodiness had infected me. When I reached under to feel her very taut udder, its heat and softness were pronounced. She pretended to lift a leg toward me with an annoyed grunt, but I knew it was because she was sore. Her foal liked one side of her body one day and the next was on the other, pushing a knee around the side of Lulu's stomach. Lulu laid her ears back close to her head at this provocation. It did seem that the nipples had faintly exuded some wax, which just ahead of the colostrum could mean imminent birth. Lulu was the tenderest of animals, though in her days as a cutting horse, she could astonish with her bursts of speed and hard sliding stops. She mourned for six weeks and her friend, when a friend of hers, a cat, went to another ranch to mouse. So her stoniness toward me at this late hour of her confinement 
was disquieting. One morning I made my accustomed feint toward the place of work and irony and went to the corrals. The geldings were asleep on the pasture except for the most avuncular of them, Lucky Bottom number 79. Lulu no longer consorted with the mares who already had their colts. Instead, she stood in the shade of the caragana bushes without any movement. She was thinner all right, but she looked alone. I went to her with a chill of fear. The speed of birth in horses is such that things go wrong quickly. But when I was a few paces away, a small head popped up and regarded me. The foal was almost invisible against the ground, and Lulu nickered to me. The afterbirth was on the ground a couple of yards away. I lifted it and inspected for completeness, glistening, startlingly heavy, still warm. The afterbirth was shaped like a bottom of a pair of long underwear with one leg shorter than the other. Any dog worthy of the name, like my thread three, consider this a windfall of immaculate protein. When I knelt by the foal, an exquisite sorrel filly, her head nodded up and down, and she moved, made several attempts to stand. Her tiny black hooves were just beginning to harden. Lulu buried her nostrils in my hair to confirm my identity and let me examine the little horse, who presently heaved herself onto sprawled legs, wobbling and erect. Arms around her, torso, her coat warm and dry, eyes big as a deer's, the beat of her heart coming through the ribcage as she yearned toward Lulu's udder. I steadied her, steadied her until the connection was made, and I saw the pumping movement in her throat. A new horse. Oh. Bobby, have you have you got any uh, pre? Because if not, we can go to. Sure. Would anybody have a question? I'll talk about yes. Anything. At the back. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait oh, we need a mic, please. <laughs> <laughs> You've had many wonderful fly fishing experiences in your life, all over the world. Could you tell us the one that you would pick? that you would like to repeat? Uh, fly fishing experience I'd like to repeat? Yes. Well, um, I would have to say that the tarpon last March was probably right on the top of that list because it was uh, an unusual experience. I, 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 I've gotten too old to fight big tarpon, but this one, uh, this one jumped itself out, and we had it at the boat in eight minutes. But what I remember the most is it was very windy out here in Charlotte Harbor. We couldn't run straight to where we wanted to go. We had to circle all the way around, hiding as we got out from the wind. And when we got where we were going, it was about four feet of water, crystal clear water with big swells coming in from the Gulf. And as these swells rose and fell, you could see laid up tarpon just suspended in the waves. And most of them were big. Uh, we caught one or two fish. Over, my my friend caught one or two over a hundred before I caught my fish. Um, it was just it was such a great thing. They're such unbelievable. You, first of all, you can't believe they'll eat a fly, yeah. and when they do, the fly is this big. And when they do, they take about three gallons of salt water with your fly. And uh, buck fever is mm -hmm. always a possibility. <laughs> uh, so that was a big one, and. Um, I've had, you know, I've fished all my life. I've had a lot of experiences where I put my head down on my pillow and run through some of them. I'm always surprised which, what might pop up. It might be something with one of the kids or with my dad or with my grandfather. Uh, it's just uh, interwoven in my life. I once feared that I'd become a writer to camouflage my fishing. So that <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, so that's the best I can come up with now. If you gave me, ask me again. In an hour, I'll have another one. <laughs> yes. Mike, please. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm interested in, in your Western connections, and you seem to have an intimate involvement in ranching. Yes. And, I, and if you did it because you went to work on a ranch. How is that ranching system working now? Are we all on big ranches? Or are there still small ranchers that... Uh, well, that's don't have machinery. I mean, they just have that intimate 
involvement with their horses or their cattle? Well, that's a great question because I think what you're referring to is a kind of ranching that's kind of uh, going away, the, fam the single family ranch. For some reasons that, t you know, a, a new swather, a new swather is a quarter of a million dollars. So yeah. they're fixing ones that are so old and falling apart, they're never going to last. And the independent nature of uh, ranchers is such that they've kind of self-sabotaged a lot. I mean, if a rancher on a small ranch buys one of these expensive swathers, his next door neighbor buys one too, and his next door neighbor. They only need one in the whole valley, but they all want their own. Um, the producers, as the ranchers themselves are called, are the sort of the end of the chain of uh, income deriving from the cattle industry. So the truckers and the feeders, everybody else does fine, but the people who raise the cattle uh, do less well. And it has a lot to do with their uncooperative nature, the sort of cowboy way um, uh, that's not working out. So the ranchers, ranchers are uh, having a hard time. Uh, there's, I would say that it's probably been at least 60 or 70 years since you could go to work on a ranch and have a ranch. So in that sense, it's not a typical American job. I mean, you could go to work for a tool and die maker and become a tool and die maker, but you can rank, go to work on ranches all your life. You're never going to have a ranch. <coughs> so it's not, uh, it's not a typical uh, American economy in that sense. It's sort of a, a glamorous one. The l latest version I can give of this uh, anecdote of this is a friend of mine was down near Jordan, Montana, looking at a place that was considering doing a conservation easement. Uh, and uh, a rent a car came down the dirt road, and a guy stopped and he said, uh, Where's the Wilson? Can you tell me where the Wilson Ranch is? And these friends of mine said, Yes, it's just up the road. You just take a left and you'll come to the ranch headquarters. And the guy said, That's great. He said, you know, it's 17 or 18,000 acres. He said, I don't know where to get into the headquarters. Uh, and the guy said, well, that's great. He said, well, I got to go have a look. He said, I just bought it on the phone. <laughs> so, uh, and that's really a sweeping reality in Montana. Montana has become fashionable. And so it's just unbelievable what's happening out there. Next. Thanks. I had uh, sort of two questions. Um, one, I read somewhere along the way, I don't know if it's true, that you had another guest, maybe in the same barn as Lulu, uh, named Jimmy Buffett. Oh, yeah. um, so I was wondering which one you liked better, Lulu or Jimmy Buffett? Lulu or Jimmy. <laughs> and then th th maybe playing on the, the previous question, um, given the experience in Montana and Texas and ranching, what do you think about uh, Taylor Sheridan's Yellowstone as a depiction of the West? Uh, a couple of things. Um, one, uh, uh, Jimmy was just at the house here on Boca Grande yesterday. And he's a dear old friend, and he's my brother-in-law. And, and uh, uh, if he hadn't fallen in love with uh, Key West, I wouldn't have fallen in love with my wife. So I know I owe Jimmy a lot. Um, so that's the f your first question. Yellowstone. I haven't seen it. Um, and uh, the director, producer of it, the guy who created the show, what's his name? Uh, Taylor, Sheridan. Taylor Sheridan. Is supposed to call me today, right? Because he just got bucked off and wants to know who can replace his shoulder. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's, that's my connection to Yellowstone. Um, well, okay, we have a question over here. Okay. I can probably hear you. My body's oh, oh, here we go. No, but the others can. Okay. Here you go. Um, you, uh, you, you lived, if you don't still live, in one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, Paradise Valley area of Montana. Uh, and my question has to do with how much of an endangered species that is. Last summer, I traveled to some very beautiful spots in the west, Bainbridge Island, uh, San Juan Islands, uh, Puget Sound, uh, Oregon Coast, uh, Columbia River Gorge. Right. And... In every place, it was interesting, I was visiting friends, they would all talk about how things had changed because the Californians were moving in, buying up land, <laughs> and rolling their money into big houses, and if the houses weren't big enough, building big houses. I'm, I, they called it the Californication of their area, but I'm curious how Paradise Valley may be dealing with that. Well, uh, I thought it had gotten Tom. pretty busy, and Tom. so 35 years ago, Tom. 35 yeah. years ago, I moved out of the Paradise Valley, and I now live in a in a 
smaller valley, which is in the foothills of the Absarca Beartooth Wilderness area. Um, you know, I would, you know, the Californians get kind of a, a bad rap. It's actually, it's Texans uh, more than Californians. <laughs> um, you know, with, with the fracking boom, we have, um, mm. we have uh, an enormous amount of money in the Dakotas and Montana, and, and they're, they even own a lot of the public buildings and stuff like that. Uh, there's one place, I was just bird hunting on this place last year, a, a, a Texan from the fracking industry had bought uh, 28 ranches and tied them all together and tore down the building. Um, uh, so there's some sweeping changes there. Most of the changes are in southwest Montana, eastern Montana, still the same desolate place. Uh, um, you know, we flew over there one time going to, not that long ago, to going to a cutting and uh, we caught a ride with a guy who had this little airplane. We flew to Wolf Point over in eastern Montana. And I never forget, we flew at night and I looked down and you didn't even see yard lights. There's just nothing down there for hours. Um, and the un unusual thing about America is really is still a very spacious, spacious place. I had a have a friend who's a private pilot, and he said you fly across the state of Massachusetts. So mostly what you see here is forests. You know, it's not as bad. It's bad, but it's not as bad as we think it is. Um, but the West is feeling this impact. We're feeling a lot of change in the demographics. Uh, th I would not. S I would say we're not feeling a lot of change in the numbers of people who would like to stand up to our taxes, especially our inheritance taxes. So these are all vacation homes. But some of them, you know, I s I, there's one on the market right now in, uh, on 20 acres outside of Bozeman, and it's on the market for 41 million dollars. Hmm. We have a fisherman over here, Gary. Hi, Tom. Hi. Um, I haven't been here as long as you have. I've been fishing here pretty hard since 1995. And I'm wondering if you have any concerns about water quality in the harbor, pressure on the fishery, uh, the absence of no wake zones, yeah. and overall rudeness of some of the guides and the fishermen. Boy, all of the above. Um, one of the things, uh, the, if you fished in the Keys as much as I did, there was, it was an old uh, uh, skiff fishery there, and people really knew the manners. Um, the west coast of Florida fishing is astonishingly ru rude. Um, you just better get used to being run over and maybe being cut off uh, and stuff. And then, this, you know, you have to remember this is, this is water here, you know, this system that we're in. This is water surrounded by land. The Keys are land surrounded by water. It's a very different atmosphere. Uh, and they've done it, that kind of fishing for so long in the Keys, there's really a protocol about how to behave yourself in the water. The other thing is the state of Florida keeps building these, these parking lots with, with uh, boat ramps. Um, so the boat pressure is tremendous. I don't think the water quality is too bad, as last I understood. Is where this has been over the years the most pristine estuary area in in Florida, uh, vis-a-vis eating oysters and whatever, as long as it's not a red tide season. But most of my fishing now, um, I just go someplace that I can get out of the boat and wade fish, mm -hmm. and. Uh, one of the reasons is the fish are getting so smart, you can't catch them out of a boat. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. You know, they just feel, feel the, high, the hydrological pressure, you know, from a boat from a long way away. So if you want to catch a smart, big, old snook, you better be afoot. A yeah. Um, we have a question here. Tom, Put can... your glasses back. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> the answer is no. He looks, he, he looks good in your glasses. Yeah, he does. He it does. looks good. <laughs> Uh, can you tell us what you're working on now? And I'd like to know um, what your preference is for what type of writing you like the best, short story, novel, uh, nonfiction, and perhaps do you have another novel somewhere coming? Well, you know, I, I started writing uh, a lot of short stories about 20 years ago, and this, this is for several reasons. One, I stumbled on this wonderful editor at The New Yorker. 
And, I, and writing for the New Yorker is a very different experience. You know, the writer is still the king there, so you're not going to turn a story in and find out somebody in the office changed the ending. <laughs> that just doesn't happen there. Um, that's part of it. Part of it is um, age. Uh, I don't want to, um, you know, writing a novel is this obsessive, full immersion that goes on for years. And, you know, I'd like to represent myself as such a pure artist that that's worth it, you know. But I, I don't even like to stay indoors is part of my problem. And I used to do it and I had to do it. Um, uh, and stay inside long enough to write a novel. And so I can't do that anymore. The other thing is the, uh, this phenomenon in American literature right now is that really cutting edge writers are almost all short story writers. Um, and since literary fiction in any form uh, pays very poorly, <laughs> um, you might as well be doing it for artistic reasons. And uh, so that's the decision I made. I mean, you have to make these decisions down through a career. It's a very unreliable career. Every time you finish a project, you're out of work. You've got to start over. And, uh, you know, I worked in movies for a long time. I never went to the movies. I don't know. <laughs> so. Yes. Right here. Where? Who? Oh. It's Alice. Hey, Alice. <laughs> hey, Alice. <laughs> okay. I love listening to all of your stories about fly fishing in Montana and everything you've done. What I really want to know is about your writing. My you writing. are not just a visionary, but you're a craftsman. And I want to know, did you, and I've heard you talk a little bit about this. Did you, were you a great reader when you were a child? And how was it studying with Stegner? And what is it that really inspired you? Well, the, the biggest question. inspiration in my writing life has been that I wasn't ever any good at anything else. That's inspirational. It's a sort of a do or die kind of uh, conundrum. Um, you know, I was lucky in a couple of ways. If you, you know, I, I don't know what the place of literature is anymore. It's not what it was, let's just say that. Um, I was lucky in that I was a little bit too old for television. I mean, it was a close call. My, my, I did never, wa I don't watch television to, to this day. My brother and sister were three years or so younger than me, and they watched it constantly. They would watch Test Pattern. Uh, and um, and my town, my hometown didn't have a movie theater. My parents were readers, um, and there were, the house was uh, full of books. And um, there was that was entertainment. I mean, if you wanted to entertain yourself, you got a book down and, and write. And that changed very rapidly. Um, so that was my my first interest in it. And then I had this romantic interest in the idea of being a writer uh, that did not involve doing any work. <laughs> I, I just, I wanted the standing, the adventurous lifestyle, but I didn't want to do any work. <laughs> but I loved, you know, I, I read a lot, I read constantly and uh, developed uh, taste in, in a certain kind of writing. I still have, a lot of that was formed pretty early and it stayed the same all my life. Um, and in the course of uh, doing it for 50 or 60 years, the, the underlying craftsmanship is something that's very engaging. And my favorite writers uh, were people who were, could express the most in the shortest time. Uh, it was, you know, Hemingway's famously named, but but uh, Turgenev and Chekhov especially. Chekhov could you know, light you up in five words. Um, so how that was achieved it, uh, fascinated me and still does. And I, 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 don't, I don't think I know how it's always done, but sometimes you stumble on it and it, and it works. So that, that's still, well, I will say one last thing. You know, they have this old rule of happiness to have someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. And I have a lot of friends who have someone to love, something to do. But as the older people, they, they don't have a lot that they're looking forward to. And in that sense, I feel very, very fortunate in that I feel if I can try to write a story, something good might happen. And that's a big thing to look forward to, even though it often doesn't happen. So, yeah. So you know what I mean. 
Bobby. Yes. Do we have another question? Yes. And I, yeah. Kind of a follow-up on Alice's question. Uh, can you tell us anything of your process or habits that you have or... Writing work habits? Is that? Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I, it's mostly, you know, John Cheever once said something that really stuck with me, which was that writing is almost entirely improvis improvisation. Um, and my experience has been if you really laid out a plan, and I've tried this, tried to write, laid out a plan for a book or whatever it is you're going to do, one. that it almost will, will inevitably, inevitably be lifeless. Um, so the best things, if I can say that, that I've written were Thank turned out very differently than what I thought I was doing when I started. Um, I taught Berk te teaching at, uh, taught, taught writing at Berkeley one year, and the students were really kind of concerned with, uh, how can I write? I don't know what I'm going to say. I mean, you, you don't know what you're going to say. You could start anywhere. Um, but you should start with something that, some image or some memory or something that uh, triggers your imagination and not be too worried about where it's going to go, A. And B, be very willing to do lots of revision. If, you're, if you have three things in place, you're willing to do, wing it, you're willing to do a lot of revision, and you have an editor you trust. Um, you have a level of creative freedom because you're freed of a lot of fear about things not turning out. You know, you, you know, you can, get, you, know you can rewrite, you know your editor can say something smart about what you ought to have done, and you can throw out a lot of false starts. And that is, as far as I'm concerned, artistic freedom. I think we have time for one more. Okay, Tom, I was going to ask you a question earlier. This is a two-part question, and the two parts have nothing to do with each other. Okay. So you mentioned being about hippies. Were you a hippie? And the other question is uh, uh, the medium you didn't address was movies uh, in reference that there were four, and I'd just be interested in your experience with movies. Okay, we'll start with hippie. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I was kind of a, a faux hippie. I mean, it was in the, in the 60s and the 70s. You know, uh, we all had long hair. I think everybody had long hair. No, shortly after that, bankers had long hair. We, <laughs> we, cut, we cut our hair off. So we were, we were just sort of culturally to cutting edge, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I had such driving fear of failure that I was, I can say honestly that I and my cohort of, in those days, we were all pretty hard working. Um, I went back, I had, they had a little event for me at Stanford last year to celebrate the, the uh, St Stegner Fellows. And uh, I went there, I met all the, this year's Stegner Fellows, and I was just amazed at how sort of sanitized they were. <laughs> they all had agents, you know, they're well dressed, they took showers. <laughs> and. Um, when we were there, I mean, I was I was there. Larry McMurtry was there, Lonesome Dove, and Robert Stone, who I think would have, if he had lived a little longer, might have won the Nobel Prize. I mean, we were pretty uh, unpredictable. I can remember holding Robert Stone down uh, in a car coming back from a bar in San Francisco when he was trying to kick the ceiling out of a of a borrowed car. You know, I mean, it, was, it wasn't at all like this kind of cleaned up thing. On the other hand, our fellowship. <laughs> allowed us to live pretty comfortably right in uh, Palo Alto. And the new new way we're getting this in what seems to me an enormous amount of money in their fellowships, uh, they're commuting from about 100 miles away because they can't possibly live anywhere near Silicon Valley. So that's part one, faux hippie. Um, <laughs> part two, the movie business. Um, as I said, I was never a movie goer, and I, to this day, don't know much about movies. Uh, but I was broke. And um, so uh, a movie producer bought, uh, bought the film rights to 92 in the Shade. And he came to the house and he said, uh, he said, you know, we, the financing's not in place and, you know, there's a lot to be done to get this peculiar movie off the ground. Do you have anything ready to go? And I said, yes, I do. Oh, that was a bald, bald faced lie. <laughs> he said, well, I'll be back in two weeks and let's look at your project. So I locked myself in my son's bedroom <laughs> for, uh, 
for two weeks. And when he came back, I had a script finished, and we, we made it right away. It was Rancho Deluxe with uh, Jeff Bridges and Sam Waterston and everything. It's kind of a cult movie, and it's still circulating. Um, my first impression was that working the movies was like taking candy from a baby. And I, well, you know, I, you know, very hard to make money writing fiction. So I thought, well, this is for me. <laughs> I'm going out there to fill my pockets. <laughs> but we made, you know, I just the immersing, you know, we made Missouri Breaks with Marlon Brando, and it was just a madhouse. And we, we made uh, several other things. I directed 92 in the Shade because the director quit. And the producer said, well, you know, we've got this, Guy Nars has this finance. We don't have, suddenly don't have a director. You're the director. So, I, you know, I had no idea how to do that. I went to a movie supply place and bought one of those things directors have. You know, I started <laughs> going, going around looking at things. I said, I guess I'm a movie director. <laughs> so I went down to Key West. We shot the movie. We came on under budget, on time. And I was remunerated to the tune of $150 a week, which was Miami crew per diem. So I was making less than the guys that they made <laughs> brought to build the sets. But I got sick of the culture and how time consuming it was. I mean, it, you, let's say you write a, write a film and you, or write a screenplay and it looks promising and you have people involved in it. You're about three or four years out with people kicking tires, waiting for things to happen. It's a very time consuming process. The industry has changed so much. When I started, and you go meet with Alan Ladd Jr. or somebody at Leeway and drop to one knee and make your pitch, and they go, okay, let's make that movie. <laughs> or no, we don't want to make that movie. Now the bankers are all involved and everybody else is very slow, glacially slow. And they've got the demographics so behind. I say, well, is this really going to be right for 17-year-olds? Um, <laughs> You know, is this a, is this you know is this PG? You know, what about the language? And um, just it's it's you know the creative energy goes out, and it's a, it's a less intense experience than actually writing, which is very intense. Are you happy? You were happy, weren't you? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> a little bit. There's a little film clip of a film called Tarpon, and you can get it on YouTube because Bobby found it. And if you want to see a hippie fighting a tarpon, him. His hair is down about here, yeah. blowing in the wind, but he lands it. Hmm. You look at it and you say, what's that guy doing in the boat? It <laughs> <No. Yeah. laughs> was a great fight. <laughs> anyway, you're all so kind to come. Let me shoot my mouth off, talk about myself. Um, hopefully you go back into a milieu where you can talk about yourselves. It's much healthier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you for all the hard work you've had getting this. I believe you were there. You both did a beautiful job. Thank you so much. Tom, Tom will sign books over here slowly because of his shoulder. Thank you.